This podcast is being brought to you by Trinity College Dublin. For further information, please visit our website itunes.tcd.ie. I was asked to speak about the whole thing around person-centred care and relationships, and uh, I wanted to kind of walk ourselves through that, and uh, hopefully I want to do that relatively quickly, um, although I can go off on one and spend uh, hundreds of hours, as people who know me know, uh, wittering on, so, because I would like to have some discussion uh, time uh, in this hour that we, that we have, have together. Um, what I want to do is really cover, cover some territory around person-centeredness and relationships as, as an interwoven thing rather than seeing them as separate things, and I'll, I'll come back to that um, a little bit, bit later. So I want to talk a bit about personhood and person-centeredness, um, and then the notion of human flourishing, which is a concept that's really uh, important to me, um, and one that uh, a lot of my work is, is trying to unravel and work with kind of philosophically. And then uh, raise some issues around uh, practice settings and how we actually help people to flourish through some of the work that uh, I've been doing here in Ireland with people like Lorna, who's, who's here, but also some of the wider international work that I'm engaged in as well. Um, and it really is a kind of a, a whole day, a whole week kind of topic in itself. Uh, but I just want to kind of just raise some of the, the thoughts that we have at this point in time that I'm trying to work with around how we create settings that help people to flourish, uh, which for me is the fundamental uh, point of life, really, about flourishing and uh, help pe helping people to live flourishing, flourishing lives. Um, Oh, I should also say I use, a, I use a lot of images in my work because I'm involved quite a lot of work in arts and health and research and the use of arts and creativity in research is a fairly uh, important part of my work. Uh, so um, hopefully you can see some of the images. A lot of them are, are kind of whitened out so you can see the text as well. But uh, the images are always chosen very deliberately to portray particular meanings. So even if the words don't resonate you, with you, hopefully uh, some of the, the imagery might do as well. Um, when I was preparing for this, I thought I'd go back as well to some of the literature just to see where some of the debate is around person-centeredness and uh, where it's at. And one of the debates that is around at the moment is the notion of whether person-centeredness is some kind of idealistic uh, notion that is unachievable uh, in terms of care and work with people with, people with dementia. And uh, one of the other debates you'll probably see going on in the literature at the moment is that of person-centeredness versus relationship-centeredness versus compassionate care versus dignified care. Um, and I'm emphasizing overly, but uh, deliberately, the word versus in all of those because uh, sadly, I think, and I think very sadly, uh, all of those approaches have been put up as competing models. Um, and I don't think it's doing us any favours whatsoever to be arguing about person-centeredness versus relationships versus <laughs> compassion versus dignity, uh, because fundamentally they are always in the same ballpark philosophically, um, and we need to kind of explore that rather than trying to say this one is better than the other one. And uh, certainly as somebody who was around in the 80s, around the models of nursing kind of hype, uh, then I certainly don't want to return to that kind of uh, sterile uh, debate that really took us nowhere um, other than into an abyss really <laughs> and uh, I would hate to see the same thing happening around, around this body of work. But the issue about whether person-centeredness is achievable or not is something that does occupy my mind quite a lot, both in terms of my own research and development work and in my own practice and seeing what happens in practice. Because on very uh, kind of uh, days when I'm feeling not so good about the whole thing, I think actually it's complete uh, nonsense that we, it's words that we use but we don't do it um, and when I'm in settings where I see anything but person-centeredness then I really think what the hell am I doing and what have I been doing for 26 odd years uh, doing this doing this kind of work but then you see absolute wonderful practice in the same time and you see the most fantastic giving of self the most fantastic relationships the most fantastic engagements with people the most fantastic settings that really you know help people to flourish and you think oh well, maybe it's not so bad after all and the key question is about how do we create that for all how do we actually try and get an ethos where that is the dominant mode of being and i don't see that as an idealism i see it as what should be reality as a fundamental thing about about living but the debate in the literature um, is, it takes a number, a number of uh, angles, really. One is about um, 
what is the role of carers within person-centred care? And certainly that was an issue that came up very early for me. It was in my own research career, which was uh, in my PhD, where actually I, in the end, talked about carers in a much more negative light than I did in a positive one. Because of, um, I, I refer to it as the professionalisation of families. Because um, when, when somebody, particularly people with a cognitive disability, were, was trying to fight their case, in a sense for their choices, then often it was families who colluded with professionals to work against that person making that choice. Um, and so there is, for some respects for me in the literature, a bit of a naivety about the role of carers or maybe a kind of a, an overinflation about their role um, and the contribution they make to people with dementia's care. And I think there is some of that um, in the literature. Uh, Trevor Adams, for example, talks about healthcare triads or care triads, that triad relationship between carers, families, um, sorry, carers, the person with dementia, and professionals, and the complexity of trying to make that triad work uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. And probably that's where there is most consistency, that it is a complex relationship uh, to try and navigate our way, our way through. The thing that uh, I've started to talk about more recently, which is coming from a lot of work, some of it in dementia settings and some of it in very acute settings, is um, this, what I refer to as person-centred care versus person-centred moments. Um, and sometimes have started to think, well, actually, all we can really aspire to is person-centred moments. Um, and uh, later I talk about um, care situations, because what I'm starting to see increasingly within the, the research I'm doing is that having person-centred care um, as a whole experience that somebody experiences all the time possibly is an idealism and possibly is impossible to achieve. But what we do see are lots of person-centred moments. And some of those moments might be fleeting um, in that they're you know, very short engagements between a carer and a person with dementia, um, or they're actually more elongated in that pe people have a, a, a more established relationship where you've got continuity of care, uh, you've got people who are working together over a period of time and have built up a strong relationship. And at that point, you get much more to what I would see as person-centred care. Um, but what I would say I see most of are person-centred moments. Um, where people have moments where it is truly person-centred and then lots of other times where it isn't. Um, it's fairly routine, fairly uh, institutional orientated and not focused on the needs of, of the individual. And it'd be interesting to know, to know your, your views around that. There's also the issue about the emotional demands of care work. Um, you know, is it realistic, in a sense, to expect people to be able to give of themselves to this extent uh, continuously? Is that, is that possible, or is that just inflating uh, humanity to a level that actually is, 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 is a, too much of an ideal for any of us to achieve? And for me, this is a really important one to work with. Within a nursing context, the work of Mengis back in the 60s demonstrated just how nurses, the reason why we have task orientation orientated <coughs> nursing, she would argue, is as a social defence. It was set up to protect us from the kind of emotional trauma that can come from having these very sustained relationships with a, a person in need of care over a long period of time. And as a result, uh, the nursing uh, organization of work became task orientated because then you didn't have to engage in that uh, engaged uh, relationship kind of way. You did tasks and you were able to dis disentangle yourself from the complexity of relationships. Sadly, we still have a lot of that and it probably still dominates. Um, whether it's the right thing to do, I think is very questionable. I don't think it is, to, is the right thing to do fundamentally. Um, but I think there is the issue about if we're not having those kind of conveyor belt systems, uh, which I do fundamentally disagree with, um, I put my own, my own values straight out here. Um, I'm trying to be dispassionate because of literature, but actually I can't stand task oriented care, so I have to put that out there. But if we are going to use that as a way of somehow managing the way we manage care, um, and if we are going to then move people into a more person-centered, engaged issue, then we move into how do we support people to sustain that, because it is difficult work. Um, and one of the things I do see are care settings who demand person-centred care but don't put anything in to support people to deliver it. And that for me is morally wrong and something we, we may talk about too. Um, the issue about power and uh, how power works in relationships, of course, is, is rife within health and social care. Um, and, you know, we can all talk the language of empowerment, but how we behave is something very different. Um, and the issue of power over people is something that is almost entrenched within a lot of our professional attitudes and something uh, that we, we often kind of impose onto other people. And so trying to have 
what I would see as non-ego driven relationships um, is pretty hard work and I think it's pretty difficult to expect to expect of people as well and again the question is how do we support people to, to mediate and negotiate those power relationships in order to help create conditions that people can feel more empowered and um, uh, the work of uh, Innes recently talks about relationship histories. One of the problems I have with relationship-centered care, as it's currently uh, written about, is that um, it, it kind of sweeps over people's histories, that it starts in the point of the, where the person is at now, um, and that's okay. I mean, I do understand all of that work in the mention that says, take the person as they are now, that's them as the, the self at this point in time. But, you know, people with dementia also have a long history that they take with them into that particular uh, care situation. Um, and equally, we have our own histories as care workers. And how do we put those histories together, for me, is really critical to how we achieve anything that might be deemed as a relationship. Um, and so I do have difficulties with the literature around relationship-centered care at the moment, which seems to dismiss the fact that relationship histories um, actually exist. Um, and that we start from the point that the person is at now. And uh, I, ethically, I struggle with that as a, as a way of, of being. So is it achievable or not? I think in part is the answer to that. Um, I think it should be achievable. It should be what we aspire to. But I think some of the challenges of getting there are, are, pretty, are pretty challenging um, to do it. Um, also, some of the challenges, as I've said, are around the way the polarized needs of carer and cared, cared for. Um, I... I know, you, Annie, I won't, I won't say anything about the Alzheimer's Ireland because I don't know enough to know about this context. But one of the difficulties when I worked in the Royal College of Nursing uh, as the head of policy for older people there that I had with the Alzheimer's Society in the UK was the kind of real dominant focus on the needs of carers. And that, um, you know, the needs of carers was the ultimate thing. And I don't have a dis difficulty with that at one level. But the needs of carers almost outweighing the needs of the person who needs care. Um, and I, I never understand, other than the carer society, who has an explicit authority <laughs> to just talk about carers, why we need to do that. Why do we need to polarise those needs in that way is something that I, I do object to because um, I think they have to come as some kind of, kind of package, as some kind of whole. I do accept, of course, the carer's assessment needs you look at their needs as a unique thing in themselves, but never outside of the context of, of that person who's needing care. Um, and uh, you can challenge me about that one later on. <laughs> but at that time, that was, was a very difficult experience of trying to, to manage those situations, really. We have lots of disempowering cultures of care. I mean, the reality is that probably most of our cultures of care are disempowering. Um, they, the fact that they are based on institutional models largely means that they are immediately disempowering. They take away the power that we have as individuals to live our lives in the way that we work because institutions by the very makeup come with a set of rules. Um, and those rules um, are either meant to be more person-centered because they're set up to help me to live my life to the full or they're set up to make for um, what you know, the Fordist people would describe as that kind of model of care that leads to things that are... Um, uh, what's the word, streamlined and work effectively, but not necessarily thinking about how does individuality and individual need work, work within that. So the issue of, of how our, sorry, of <laughs> our uh, settings work, I think, is, is also a big challenge for us. Um, the, the next set of um, bullet points for me in terms of challenges are about organizations. Um, I think one of the biggest issues we have, and we have it in this country, are you know, policy documents, strategy documents, organizational philosophies and values that espouse person-centeredness as a principle, but absolutely behave in a way that's completely anti that when it comes to people. And I'm talking about staff, and I'm talking about, about service users. Um, and there is a whole moral issue here. People, people wrap it up as an economic issue. Um, and I was having that uh, conversation last week on, a, on an advisory committee I'm on with the Joseph Rowntree Foundation on one of their, their new programs about, you know, people talk about the reason why we can't be person-centred is to do with economics. And it's complete rubbish. It's to do with morality. Um, because if there is a will to actually readjust services in a way that is person-centredness, then there isn't an economic issue. Because actually, if you do it properly, then it doesn't actually cost more. In fact, it costs less in many, in many ways. Um, but we have now a kind of a rhetoric that uh, puts it into an economic analysis rather than a, mor a moral one. And I feel we have to drag it back out from that discourse and put it into a one that's about morality rather than um, uh, economics. 
And so then to, there are some of the challenges, but um, for me, there is, there is no choice. Um, there is no choice about being person-centered or not person-centered. And uh, I'm currently doing some work with the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Northern Ireland, where we're doing, it's precisely to make this statement. One of my uh, beliefs really is that until we have uh, person-centeredness or treating people with respect in, in, the, in that kind of language enshrined as a human right within our care models that we won't ever really see a shift towards person-centeredness in the way that we might want to at a, at a macro level because it's always put out there as a choice it's always there as you know when we're not too busy when things aren't too pressurized that we can be person-centered or you know the language I hear a lot of you know, when we get through the rest of the work, then we can be person-centered. I think this might be me shaking this around, but I'll try to stop shaking it. Um, <laughs> but, and, and that's the whole wrong process for me, that it has to be an enshrined principle that we try and live our lives by. Um, and in doing that, then it's about how we, how we actually work with other people. And the work of Martin Buber, uh, going way back for me, is, is the essence of that. Uh, Buber talks about an I-thou versus an I-it relationship. Um, and an I-thou relationship is one that is about engagement, it's about how we connect with another person as a real human being, um, and that I, I work with beliefs, values, who you are, the whole, all of your foibles, everything that makes you up, up as a person, and you, me, and you, you, we start from that basis. How we car carry on, then, is about how we negotiate it, but we start from that basis that that's where we're at. Um, whereas an I-it relationship is that I'm engaging with you because I have a particular need and you could provide it. So it's more of a utilitarian, you know, you've got a use and I can, I can benefit from that. And unfortunately, I think if we look at a lot of the dementia literature around person-centeredness or not, there is a lot of the I-it kind of, kind of relationship. And what we're really trying to do in a lot of the research and development work is to move that to a fundamental starting position of starting from an I-thou, that we're starting as two equals, uh, two equals as hum two equal human beings, and we start to negotiate a relationship on that on that basis. And Buber's work is is very significant philosophically for helping us to to shape that. And at the heart of that is the notion of personhood. Um, how do we respect people's core being as a, as a person? And probably most people in this room are probably most familiar with Tom Kitwood's work on on that respect uh, in terms of how. Uh, he really uh, was so groundbreaking in the way that he challenged the status quo around, around dementia care. And in some respects, I feel quite sad about the way that uh, Kitwood sadly died too early in his life, really. Um, but equally, um, there's been a lot of, of, in a way, critique. And some of that critique, I think, is justified. But I think we, we haven't paid enough, um, I think, honour to the fact that he really challenged what was a very dominant status quo um, that that wasn't Buber, but it was very much the, the kind of I-it it relationship. But there's been quite a lot of work since Kitwood's initial work um, around personhood and person-centeredness and what it means now, and quite a lot of international work, which is very exciting and, uh, and I think is going to form a huge evidence base that we, we, can, we can work with. And uh, one of those was uh, um, in 2004, the journal that I actually edit um, the International Journal of Older People Nursing, if you want to plug to get a paper in there, um, was uh, we, in one of our first issues, we decided to put up front uh, the notion of person-centeredness. And we're just about to do that again in a special issue in June to look at the international evidence around outcomes in person-centered practice. Um, and um, what I led a, a literature review to look at kind of the breadth of literature that was out there to say, well, what does this mean simply? What does this, in a simplistic way, what would this mean, these complex kind of philosophical terms, what would they mean um, in an everyday sense of, of doing practice? And in an everyday sense, they mean four forms of being is, is what we summarize them down to be. There's about, as a person, I exist in a social world. Um, and so that, for me, moves us through this uh, battle that exists about the difference between health and social care. Um, I always tell the story because it was probably one of the funniest points in my career really was again when I was working in the Royal College of Nursing as head of policy. The person who was head of policy for um, community nursing was equally developing uh, some role statements about the role of district nurses um, in the UK. And uh, the fight really went on about the difference between a health-orientated bath and a social-orientated bath. 
and uh, and it was really quite the most horrific bit of, of engagement you ever saw. You thought, what the hell is this? You know, why are we even having this conversation? And of course, what I was trying to do is to illustrate when would you need a registered nurse to do a bath? Because if you need a registered nurse, then they're doing a therapeutic health input. <laughs> And if you don't need a registered nurse and you need a care, social care worker, then that's not health, that's social in some way. And at the same time, I was working as a nurse in a community hospital in Oxford, and uh, I was bathing this woman one day, and I said to her, I was saying to her, God, you know, this is what, she was, what else are you doing? Oh, I'm doing this. And, um, and I said to her, so tell me, you know, do you consider this a health bath or a social bath? And like, she's going, what? And then she said, she was a classic Cowley woman from Oxford, really, and she said, I'll tell you what, love, it'd be a lot more social if you were in here with me. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, okay, that kind of breaks it all down. And uh, it's that, you know, that whole nonsense that, uh, you know, there is some kind of divide, when actually, for me, to take it about a social world, um, you know, being healthy means existing as a social being. So anything we're doing in terms of health is about, has a social context, and we can't actually separate, separate that out. So the, the divide for me is a non-divide, and uh, it, it doesn't exist. Also, the se second part is about being in relation, and this is where I see relationship-centered care as being a component of person-centered care, because one of the things we have as persons is we exist in relationships um, in various forms, in positive ways or negative ways, in ways, as I said, with maybe carers who may control our lives, with others who want to empower our lives. There's a whole variety of, of complex relationships. Um, and again, one of the concerns I have is, uh, is uh, the current uh, discussion that's going on with the potentially incoming Tory government about the meaning of family in that, in that context, because we're seeing potentially a return to this traditional notion of family equal husband, wife, and 2.3 kids. Um, and in fact, family is a very broad, much more broad notion than that in terms of, in terms of relationships. The third part is about being in place. We all exist in some kind of place, be it a metaphorical idea of, of place or a physical place. Um, you know, we know older people generally being discharged from hospital, they want to go home to what they consider to be their home. Um, and everything else, no matter how way, however way we, we wash it up, is a compromise. And it's how do we manage that compromise that's the, that's the critical, critical factor, unless they're, they've been living in some kind of social situation that is so awful for them that they, they have made that journey really for, for themselves. But there is some very good literature, particularly within the health geography literature, um, around the meaning of place and space. Uh, for older people and of course it holds very very different meanings for all of us um, in terms of uh, you know the actual place we live versus the place we go to in our head versus the meaning of space that we, that we utilize and how space uh, is managed and how we mediate different different spaces. Uh, one of the great papers I read around that was called um, nurse, uh, Air, Aeroplanes of Flying Nursing Homes and it was this idea of the, the analogy that exists between sitting in an airplane for eight hours um, and often what happens in non-person-centered care homes. You know, so you're sitting beside somebody you don't really want to sit beside. Uh, you potentially may not speak to them because you're trying to work out, do I really want to speak to them or do I want to be doing something else? And if I speak, does that mean for the whole eight hours I'm going to be stuck in a conversation? Um, you're not given any choice about that. You're not given choice about the time which you eat. It's going to arrive at that time and that's how it is. You have limited choice about what you actually get to eat. You need the whole pattern. And it was this really good analogy about space and how do we actually... Uh, create those spaces to get away from, from that kind of scenario. Um, and often place and space is how we articulate our personhood. We, we relate very strongly to places when we, when we articulate personhood, which again takes me back to the critique about the relationship-centered piece about honoring individual histories, because individual histories make the now so significant, because the now is, is how it's, it's manifested, but it comes with a, a, long, a long history. And then the last bit is about being with self. How comfortable do I feel with being with me? Which, you know, might seem a bit of a bizarre way to look at it. But if we think about um, depression in older women, for example, a lot of depression in older women is to do with unresolved histories, to do with unresolved parts of their lives that haven't been, been sorted, sorted out and so therefore uh, manifest themselves through, through depression in, in later life. And so how we kind of understand myself, my values, uh, my beliefs, and um, the things that have impacted on my life and, and the way I engage with them now is a huge part of my personhood. 
the, that whole history again that, that I bring with me. So when, we're talk, when I'm talking about personhood, I really kind of summar, summarize it down to these four modes of being. And what we're trying to do is to help people to live in a full way through these modes of, modes of being. The work that uh, I did with uh, Lorna and others in the Older People's National Practice Development Program that we were doing, we set about defining um, person-centeredness because, interestingly, it's never really been defined. There's a lot of descriptions written about it, but nothing that really defines it. And that, and that was quite interesting, actually, that we, there hasn't been that attempt. Uh, there is a question to say, well, why not? And maybe it's a good thing that there hasn't, there hasn't been because we don't want to kind of put it into a tablet of stone and say, therefore, this is what it is. Uh, because I think it's got many dimensions to it that we would want we would want to see in there. But fundamentally, it is about the formation of relationships. Now, interestingly, we have therapeutic relationships in here, and I've got a colleague I'm doing a lot of work with nationally here around uh, the redesign of care homes, and she really objects to the notion of therapeutic relationships because that implies health, whereas not all relationships are therapeutic. And I do have a lot of sympathy for that for that uh, view that, you know, if I'm working with, with you as a, as a person in need of care, then we'll have a relationship that's therapeutic, but we'll also have a relationship that's fun and social and all the, all the rest of it. But is that therapeutic or isn't it? And because the kind of health literature has this focus on therapeutic interventions, then I think there's a tendency to see therapeutic equaling some kind of health input. So I think it's an interesting discussion. <laughs> but it is about What's important about this definition is about it's not just about what we do to, with, and for people in need of care, but it's also about how do we engage as colleagues. And it takes me back to the point I said earlier about the challenges of person-centeredness, about the fact that many of the people that I work with as registered nurses, carers, care workers, etc., etc., and in the community as well, you know, if you look at families trying to work in a person-centered way, um, the challenges that they have around not being treated with that respect, with the dignity, etc., is enormous. Um, and that is where the huge issue for me lies, is that person-centeredness gets talked a lot in relation to what one person does with two and for another, but not about how do we engage as colleagues? How do we work with those person-centered values as colleagues? So if you work in a strong hierarchical, um, undermining culture where people you know, don't have autonomy over their practice, who are told what to do, where it's constantly you know, leadership by diktat, then how can you expect that same person to work with these you know, lofty humanistic values? I don't experience it myself, how can I then give it in, a, in another way? So the work that I'm interested in is how we create settings that help everybody to flourish, staff, residents, patients, users, whoever it is, uh, that actually allows all of us to flourish. And for me, that's both the end, as in that's what we're striving for as an outcome, but it's also the process of getting there. It's the way we engage with each other and how we, how we learn and how we work together. Um, so it's, I hope you can read that. Um, there's a reasonable amount of work around the notion of human flourishing, but not vast, actually. It's, it's an area that's uh, been kind of talked about, but not really, really studied. And some of the early work was done by uh, people like Den Lincoln and Denzen uh, from a qualitative research perspective, who were very much arguing that um, too much of our research is, is uh, this kind of dominant science paradigm, um, and that uh, what we have to do is open that up to actually free, free that up um, and allow multiple perspectives to come together. And they argue that it's that's like a sacred, a sacred space, that we have to create spaces that allows all forms of knowing to come together, which is fundamentally what makes us all up. You know, we don't just see the world from a sing singular perspective, no matter how much we argue that we do as a researcher or whatever, that we, we do have multiple perspectives in the way we, way we live our lives. Um, and what it's about is fundamentally promoting the whole human being whether it's through our research, through our practice, through, through my day-to-day -day, day -to -day living. And um, essentially, there are some key words, which uh, largely comes from the work of my, me and my colleague Angie Titchen, uh, where for us, flourishing is about working in partnership, um, that it isn't about an ego, power-based relationship. It is fundamentally about trying to be a partner with another person. Uh, so the question then is, how do we work in partnership with, for example, people with dementia, um, when the tendency can be to exert power, even if we're not deliberately doing that, we can actually fall into, into us doing that. It's about achieving growth. It's about that inner knowing, knowing what's right. And we all have a very intuitive 
intuitive sense of that, but also pushing at the boundaries, which is something I think in dementia care we have to do much more of. We're very conservative in dementia care in the way we actually, actually work. Um, you know, we only need the next set of policy guidance to stop us taking any more risk. Um, and so we kind of stop doing things that, uh, you know, we wouldn't dream of doing with, uh, with people who don't have a dementia. And I had that experience uh, in the hospital I worked in up to three years ago where um, we had a person with, with dementia uh, wander um, out of the, the, the ward that he was on um, onto the motorway and got killed. Um, but that unit was open for 22 years, and that was the first time in 22 years that that had happened to anybody. And that case went to the ombudsman, and uh, the ombudsman ruled that the whole unit had to be locked. So, you know, so here we have one case in 22 years, and the whole unit is locked, uh, without any recourse to people's individual, individual freedom. Now, people living in their own homes wander out their front doors every day and we don't therefore say we're going to put the you know security police around every community and make sure your door is locked and you can't open it unless I tell you. I mean there's a an illogic to that that never makes never makes sense to me. But somehow when it comes to settings with dementia we seem to just accept it. And that unit we fought for two years afterwards the uh, after the Ombudsman's ruling uh, to fight that that particular ruling and we, we lost. Um, and we lost partly because I was interested that so many to staff felt good about that because it took away the pressure of having to manage the situation. So after years of getting them to work differently, in one foul sweep that was gone because they no longer had to worry about how do we manage the work to ensure that we can monitor people, be with them, spend time with them. We no longer have to think about it because the door is locked. So it's, it's, these things have got quite severe con um, consequences, I think. And for me, the essence of person-centeredness is around there is a natural flow. And hence the reason for this image is one I took when I was uh, traveling through Argentina. And I was in Buenos Aires in a particular beautiful part of the city where they literally do do salsa dancing in the street, as another picture shows. Um, and this old guy whose uh, son owned the bar I was sitting at, um, every woman that passed by him, he danced with her. And he, within seconds, they were dancing in a very fluid you know, as if they had been dancing together all their lives. And it really struck me about the essence of care, you know, that it's like a dance. When it's really good, it happens like that, and it really works well, either as colleagues or as the person working with. And uh, that imagery sticks in my head forever, really, of watching how instant that is. But when we're talking about person-centered workplaces, again, uh, Kitwood's work uh, really gives us a kind of a menu of what we need to be working with. Now, it's a very complex menu and one that I think many settings do struggle with trying to, uh, trying to make sense of. And in some of the uh, work I've been doing uh, with my colleague, uh, Tanya McCants, we've been turning this into a model uh, of person-centered practice with an, e an emphasis on bringing together the setting, the environment, and the way care practice happens. And I don't have time to go into this in any great detail. But just to say how we see it is that there are a set of prerequisites that people come with uh, in being person-centered. So my competence to do the job I'm supposed to be doing, for example. Um, my own beliefs and values. Do I know my own beliefs and values and how I, that might impact on the way I approach a person with dementia, for example. So again, a colleague I work with, Jan Dewing, one of the things we do in workshops with people is getting people to act out their dementia persona you know, what would I be like if I had a dementia? What, how would I behave? In order to try and get inside myself and the kind of things that I might react to uh, in different ways when I'm working with, with somebody with dementia. And we take that into a particular setting, which is the uh, purple line in the middle, which is the care environment. Because no matter how much I espouse wonderful values of person-centeredness, the care environment we increasingly know internationally from the evidence will determine whether I can work in that way or not. So whether that is an empowering environment, whether it's one that has got a shared set of values, whether it is one that allows me to take risks, etc., all of those things work or don't work uh, in terms of me being person-centred. And I, I had this conversation with a colleague in Edinburgh yesterday um, over lunch, you know, one of those heated, heated lunches that always inevitably talks about practice in the end. And, um, and it was about the fact, because he's a, a supervisor in practice of student nurses, and he said, I just don't understand... I, I do understand, um, you know, why the, the student nurses that I see in their first placement are bubbling and the conversation is really lively and then I see them in third year and they're going, you know, what's this about? What am I doing? And, of course, it's what's happened to them 
in these care environments. What's happened to them in terms of that experience and the way they're supported and enabled is, is so critical to what goes on. And then when we work with this, the five kind of petals of the flower are how we engage with the person in need of care. They're the processes for working with a person who, who is needing, needing care of, of some kind. And we have identified five key processes that make care person-centered, and that's all of our care can fit into that. And if we take account of all of those, then we can see uh, person-centered outcomes, which, I mean, the words aren't necessarily ones that translate everywhere. We do change the words to match different contexts, but largely they're about <coughs> a sense of satisfaction, a sense of involvement, a greater sense of well-being and the creation of a therapeutic culture. That is a culture that is largely is person-centered. So the, a lot of the research and development work I'm doing is really about operationalizing that uh, within, within different settings uh, to try and get people to understand person-centeredness at a deeper level than just about this giving of choice, which for me is a, a very superficial notion of person-centeredness. I told you was another one. And if we look at the work that uh, I'm doing in, in various projects, and again, including the one we did, we did here in Ireland. Then we can relate it back to these four forms of being, but this time we say, well, how do we know the person? How do we know myself as a care worker? How do I know my own limitations? And how do I know the environment? And so the work that uh, we engage in is about trying to help people to understand those things. So if we take about, uh, firstly, knowing the person, then the kind of reflective questions we would work with would be, would be some of those on the left, and the kind of activities that we would engage in would be those on the right. <laughs> and um, those are you know, ways of helping people to engage at different levels with, with uh, understanding personhood in its, in, its, in its round sense, really. And of course, central to that is biographical assessment, which again is another reason why the relationships thing jars with me, because we know that biography is about people's histories, is about how we are now, um, and is a, a great way of starting to have that kind of engaged relationship with somebody. But you can see um, the kind of things that uh, help us to try and get inside the person we're working with. How do we know that person in a way that isn't just about name, age, and diagnosis, and all of, all of that end of, end of things, really? But how do I know myself as a care worker? Again, there are a set of reflective questions that we can work with uh, to try and get inside those around my values. Um, but also, a lot of our work focuses on developing value statements, getting teams to really tease out uh, the shared values, not as just some glossy statement, but to actually really dig into the meaning of those words. What do those words really mean for how I, how I practice and how I engage and communicate with other, with other people? One of the things we, we actually started on, the, it was on the national program here in Ireland, was this business of everyday talk. Um, and that probably, I don't know if Norna would agree, was probably one of the most significant things we did uh, in those settings. And there was two or three settings that were, um, two that were dementia specialist units, and the rest had quite a mix um, of people right across those units, um, was the way we talk about, about people. And in fact, that had the biggest impact in terms of changing practice. So why do we call we talk about dement demented. I mean, when we use the language demented, I always think of Harry Potter, you know, the dementors who you know, come to strike you down, really. But why do we use language like the demented? We use language like feeding. Um, when we would say about we go out for a meal, but we feed people who, who may need help rather than helping them to eat and drink or helping them to have a meal. We use language like things like nappies when we're talking about incontinence aids. And somehow that's acceptable when there are things we put on babies. Um, we use things like cot sides when we're talking about bed rails or security rails. So all of this language, for me, dehumanizes people anyway. And if you do nothing else after today, I would ask you to go back and reflect on the language you use in the setting that you, that you work in. Because it does have a significant... Language isn't just words. It is a reflection of where I come from and how I behave and how, how I act. Um, and we developed long lists of the words that people were using. Uh, we got families engaged in it. We got older people themselves engaged in it. Um, and it's created a whole culture where people picked each other up. So if I said, I'm going to feed such and such a person, or if I had said something worse, like, who's on the feeds today, um, then I could challenge it and say, that's not what we say around here. That <laughs> and it doesn't have to be conflictual. It can just be done as, 
that's not what we're doing. So, and that really started to change to where people viewed things because it just stopped just that taken for granted stuff, really. So I would really ask you to think about um, language as an important thing. In terms of knowing limitations, again, here is the issue about support. We all have limitations in being person-centeredness. There's no way that I can be this perfect you know, human being who is always going to work with values. I am going to be grumpy some days. I'm going to have a bad time at home. Of course, that's going to impact on the way I work or the way I engage with the person. Uh, my partner's mother you know, has dementia in, in Aberdeen. And I can see, you know, some of the, the tension that exists. Um, and even though that's not how they want to be, you can see how that tension, just because of day-to-day -day life, really. But what that means is we need support systems in place to help people to work through those issues. Again, the unit I ran in Oxford, one of the most successful things we did was to give people permission to say, I can't stand working with this person. Or this person is driving me nuts. I can't do any more with them. Um, and that that's an okay thing to say as long as there is a follow-up set of questions and support that says, how can I help you? What would work best for you? What do I need to do to help you once you've got that kind of culture in place? So, you know, and we have to be able to say those things. Otherwise, we're, we're living in a pretense. So things like active learning and supervision, etc., are really important to making that work. One of the other things that uh, is a big bugbear of mine is... Um, this if it works yep is this notion of the simple tasks that are given away by uh, by people and uh, if ever you know I think certainly as a nurse we have done people with dementia and others a disfavor it's this business of the way we label tasks and one of the classics of course that's given away is that of for example helping an older person with dementia to eat and drink which, you know, often we give to people who have literally walked through the front door, having never worked in, in a care setting before, that that's the task that's given, given to them to do. Um, and what I try to help people to see is that actually this is an incredibly complex task. And just as I, as a, you know, a, a non-registered nurse, would not be sent into an intensive care unit and handed a respirator and told, get on with it, you know, there's a button, there's the one, there's the alarm, uh, have a go, we shouldn't be doing that with people in the same way who need help with their food and drink, help to eliminate, all of those, those activities. But we do, and we are still doing it, um, when in fact these are the complex tasks of working with people with dementia, not the ones that should be given away. So how we do all of these becomes really important. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm not going to go through this. But um, how we know the environment. We know there's a huge literature around the environment in, per in dementia care. Um, there's a vast literature around the environment in dementia care, and yet so many of our, our environments don't stack up to that, to that evidence. And again, I think it's something we really have to look at critically and not just accept. The reason often why those environments exist is again given as, a, as an economic argument, when in fact there is a moral argument about why should we accept that people live in some of those conditions. Uh, we would not accept that for, um, for, for other people. Um, so, you know, we, we have to challenge some of that and there are lots of things we can do to enhance the environment that doesn't require mega bucks and it is it's often seen as we need, you know, brand new environments. Brand new environment doesn't mean person-centred care, as we know. Um, it can just be just as ritualistic and traditional um, in a brand new environment as it can be in what might be seen as the old workhouse kind of, kind of environment. And in fact, I've seen better care in some of those environments than in the brand, the brand new environment. But the environment can help us quite, quite a lot. Um, and again, on this program, we developed uh, something called cat skirts, lipsticks and handbags, which was uh, not in any research text that you'll ever see. Uh, but again, it's tools for helping people to engage. And it was about trying to uh, it came from the pilot project we did back uh, about four or five years ago uh, in the Midlands. And we were trying to get uh, the nurses and care workers to try and Im feel person-centred care. Because one of the things I really do feel strongly about is that you never really get person-centred care until you feel it. You have to kind of really feel it before you know it. And, um, and we couldn't, we weren't getting there. It was all about no time, too many tasks, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so the facilitator asked the question, you know, what would be the thing that you would really kill for, you know, in your life? The thing you would not, you would go to the death for that you're never going to let go of. I know exactly, you know, it's easy. Um, if I'm in a care home, I hate cats. Um, so I don't want any of those pet therapy people coming at me with cats. Can't stand them. 
Um, I haven't worn a skirt since I left school, and so don't put me in a skirt, which of course still happens. Um, I n I'm never seen in public without my lipstick, so I must have that at all costs. And anything I possess that's of value is in my handbag. And so we went, now oh, that's a brilliant idea. So throughout uh, the program we've been doing for two or three years, we had everybody going around finding out what were they. So we said, do you, do you know the four things your residents really would die for? What are those four things? And uh, I, I haven't got time to read a long list, but what was the revealing thing about it was that none of them meant extra resource, more time, or anything else. It just meant a slightly different way of working, uh, which was about working with that person and what they, what they valued. And it makes a huge difference to everyday, day-to-day -day living. And I mean, it's as simple as things like a packet of potato crisps. Um, it was as simple as things, which was simple but really challenging to occupational therapy and physiotherapy colleagues, things like some, some of the women said, I hate trainers, I've never worn trainers, and yet I'm in trainers in this room, I like shoes with a heel. But of course, we people say, well, you can't, they can't have a heel. Well, why can't they have a heel? You know, so those kind of, of things become very simple, but actually just require us to think, think differently. And there are a lot of things that can be done to the physical environment, as we know, to, to enhance. I'm just going to stick through that. So where I'm at at the moment is that uh, I'm quite intrigued by some new work that's come out by people uh, called Senge. And if you may know Senge is from management literature, but he's not a big U-turn himself, to coin a phrase, um, and now comes from a much more humanistic place um, around how we develop uh, practice and how we help people to transform. How do we transform people and settings? And him with a, another guy called Otto Scharmer have come up with this theory U, uh, which I've used uh, with, in one of, with one of my PhD students, and it was incredibly successful. But the, my point of raising this is that we are genuinely talking about person-centered care and creating that, then putting people into classrooms and training them how to do it is never going to get there. It, it just isn't going to get there. And it's one of my big bugbears in life, is the fact that we spend so much time on tr traditional training uh, to do is this kind of work, when it just is not going to help people to get there. Um, and instead, what we have to do is we have to be facilitated to, that you work through the U, so you go down, which is a, you know, can be a painful long experience and then you come back up again when you kind of start to find different ways of, of engaging. But to begin with you have to be able to suspend, that is you have to be able to see your own seeing. How am I seeing the world? Um, you have to be able to suspend that and try and, and work differently. Find a redirection and let go of it. Kind of say, okay, that's not serving me well or it's not serving how we work well. We have to move, move away from that. But when we do that, we move into this space at the bottom of the U, the deepest place, which is about presencing. It's about how we are present for each other in supporting us to transform into working and being and engaging in a different, in a different way. And that requires all the support infrastructure we can put around people to do that. And what uh, Donna Brown, a PhD student's research, demonstrated was that it needs something called psychological safety. People have to feel safe in their setting, that they can actually take risk, that they can challenge the norm, that they'll be held, that they'll be supported, they won't be blamed, they won't be disciplined, all of those, unless they do something terrible, um, all of those you know, kind of things, that we need practice settings that are psychologically safe, that actually help people to feel that. And when we get that, then we can start to envision a new future, a different way of realizing, a, a different way of being really, and we start to come up again, we come out as, as very different uh, people. Now, this is a very simplistic uh, overview of a very complex kind of process of engagement and helping people to, to work and to be, to be different. And in the work we've been doing, we use these kind of tools uh, to help us to, to kind of do that, to go through that process over two, three years sometimes with teams um, of bringing about that kind of, kind of transformative change. So it's not a one-week project or a month-long project or whatever. It's actually a whole process of engagement to help people to, to work and, and be different. And, but at the end of it, we can kind of talk to the philosopher we need a poo, really, because uh, the reason, uh, it's actually a really good book, if you ever get hold of it, called The uh, Tao of Poo and the Tao of Piglet. So it's a, it's a Buddhist uh, text put into the language of Winnie the Pooh, if you can ever, ever imagine. But it's, uh, it really strikes home for me in terms of my perspective about how we make this work, because um, 
as I said, go right back to the beginning, one of the challenges I have with the whole person-centeredness debate at the moment is where it's gone to. It's become this kind of lofty thing outside of the reality of practice. And for me, the only place it can exist is embedded within practice. And what this quote argues is that if we actually see what's under our nose, then we might actually see what we need to change. But if we constantly look outside and look away for those answers, we're never really going to get it. We have to start from where we're at. Thank you very much indeed. For such a thought-provoking and really stimulating presentation, a fantastic journey, like whistle-stop tour through dementia and person-centric care. I'm conscious of your time, I've got some time though, okay. five, ten minutes yes, for okay. questions. So can I open the, um, this event to you, the audience, and um, hear any questions? Yes, Kat. I am Kat Cumbry, and I worked in the HSC until last year, and I had some responsibility uh, around residential, our own residential care units, some which you were involved with. And uh, I witnessed very well-meaning, committed people unable to implement person-centeredness. Every unit nearly had a person-centered project going. Some had two or three, which was a little worrying. <laughs> and uh, you've, I mean, everything you said resonated very well. But I just wonder, how, how do you transform? How do you make that transformation in people? Yeah. You talked about that long three-year process. It's not, clearly not practical for everybody in every unit now. <coughs> we don't have the staff to direct it, I would say, to, for starters. Uh, I think you need to start a nursing school, obviously, with this whole process. I mean, is there any, we've tried Training, I agree with you, we're training up the wazoo, massive money went into training, but when people got back to their units, the environment wasn't empowering, obviously, or whatever yeah. reason it fell down. Is there, a, is there a case to be made for putting a, either a nursing student or a staff in the, in the physical space of the resident for a week? I know this is done in medical school here, isn't it? Don't they put students in a wheelchair? Oh. A couple of days, like that. I mean, it's, it seems very simple, but yeah, no, I mean that um, that does happen in nursing and care work as well. Those kind of kind of strategies. Um, I'm, I'm actually going from here to the launch of the uh, at the Department of Health the practice development strategy, the Irish, yeah. which I've been involved in in leading, and uh, and that's you know one of the things that I'm saying at that, and we have said in the strategy is we have to completely re-engineer the way we do training and development. Um, the I I mean I would say it's, it's at the wrong starting point to say, you know, that uh, we, we can't do it because it's just too busy and blah, 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 blah. Um, so for me, staff yeah. and, and physical facilities yeah. were always thrown up. They are, and it's the, it's, the wrong pl it's the wrong place to start, as the, you know, the directions always give. It is about creating facilitated engagements, and we haven't put any effort into that particularly. We, and seeing it as projects makes it all wrong as well. And Ireland has a long history of that projects from elsewhere that come and go. And, then, and we had that with the person-centered program, where people I mean, said, oh, so this is the next one. You know, it was I'm glad you focused on mealtime because it's so basic. And as a casual observer, I could go in and see people brought to the dining room a half an hour before anything happened because it suited. Seeing care staff untrained doing the actual work of mostly feeding, literally yeah. feeding people, seeing plates come out with the food already on, so many things that dehumanize yeah. and institutionalize people. I could see that so easily. And yet, you know, so if we put a nurse manager, a care staff I in think, that yeah. person's place, would that make a difference? Not particularly. Do you want to go? <laughs> I'll have to. A lot of the training we did at the CSIBC, we had uh, people, uh, delegates who stayed, who were forced to think about closing their eyes, thinking that they had a dementia. What did they? What would they like least to be done to them? What would they like most to be yeah. done? So that was. But I think the big challenge is trying to get uh, the leaders and yeah. those in charge of these facilities to actually take on board issues to do with change, and it's often organizational change. And if they're not involved in the training, and if they're not behind training programs, <coughs> I think, you know, it's really very much wasted. Of course. And they, they, and yes, but they need to be the facilitators of it, and that's yeah. where we have it wrong as well. I mean, the same thing is happening here as happened to us in the UK which is that, you know, nurse leaders, the role was changed from one of clinical expert to manager. 
and we have the same thing. So you pile on more and more management responsibilities. If you look at the kind of competency descriptors now, they're largely management ones, not clinical expertise ones. And for me, we need a radical <laughs> overhaul of that. That these are these have to facilitate persons under care, not external project people coming in like me and others, but it's the fundamental role of the clinical leader, be it nurse, social worker, whoever, is that of a facilitator of that. Um, I don't, I don't, well, I'm not convinced about that, but I think, because uh, I don't think regulation ever brings about transformational change. I think it puts some framework in place, but we have to populate that with an approach that is largely facilitative, that says these are the kind of journeys we have to go through, but we have to also redirect some of that education money that, for me, you may as well just throw it off the top of the bank and let it swim <laughs> off somewhere. It's massive. And maybe, you know, more positive incentives like offering nursing home rewards and incentives to actually change practice mm -hmm. and yeah. see, you know, new policies in place. I, yeah. Yeah, I have to, sorry, don't want to take away from Maybe you could just introduce yourself. Oh, it's Annie Dunham from the uh, Alzheimer's Society. But I have to answer, uh, just to, to uh, address something Brenda said very early, and thank you for Brenda's brilliant uh, overview of the whole area. Uh, but just in relation to the Alzheimer's Society, I mean, it was founded nearly 30 years ago by carers. So yeah. carers who were advocating, really, to provide services that weren't there. And, and, and you could still do that. And I think it, it's interesting, any... Um, grassroots-based organisation goes through a huge amount of change and also would have the same perceptions of dementia and persons under care and all of these things that exist in the wider society. And I suppose just to, to briefly close, I would say that we also in, in the society would be grappling with the whole concept of persons under care. We've looked at doing work on stigma and uh, ed educating uh, for people with dementia and focusing heavily on the person with dementia totally at the centre. And the, the carers that founded the organisation are still very much part of that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks, thank Annie. Thank you for that. Uh, Patricia. Uh, thanks very much for the really stimulating uh, input. I really appreciated it. Uh, I'm Patricia uh, from DSIDC. Um, just two points. I agree with you completely about the issue of language and how important it is. But I really think that it's very much the tip of the iceberg. And changing the words doesn't necessarily change uh, what's happening below. And I think that's visible from lots of different places where we, we get new words that are more PC, but the attitudes don't change. And people adopt the PC words, whether that's in the disability area or any area of life. You know, um, So I think it's a reflection of what's happening, but it's not necessarily always just uh, the other thing I was very interested in is, is the concept of spirituality and developing that. And I think what mitigates against that is very often our individual professional role we're in. And um, the, the spirituality brings us beyond our individual role to an area where cross uh, professions we can connect together. And I'm just wondering how we can develop that so that it's seen or, or it's something that we can all see keeping our professionalism but also adapting this thing that's across mm. both our professional roles and then the people that we're in charge mm. with caring for. Mm. Can I just ask you, is yeah. it spirituality or is it relationships? I suppose spirituality as a name for something that's beyond um, our practical <coughs> work. Uh, and, and maybe there's another name for it as well. It can be relationship or I suppose it's a dimension beyond, isn't mm. it? It's yeah. yeah. <coughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think that, I think that some of the discussions that I, I've been involved in are around this word spirituality, because it, it coins a particular set of, often a particular set of meanings, particularly in countries where there's dominant religion. Um, then you, it tends to get, no matter how hard we try, it tends to get locked into some of that. I like the Lincoln and Denzen. I mean, for me, it is about human flourishing. That's where I start from. It is about that notion of sacred, um, that, you know, the, the values, the beliefs, the hopes, the dreams, the wants uh, that I have are what make me, um, if you want to call it a spiritual being, but it is the sacred part of me as a person. Um, and it's that that is, is, I think, the bit that we don't have too much dialogue about and we don't spend enough time. And equally, people get very... Uh, very nervous about it and uh, really struggle with, with trying to engage with it because actually we have to do this to do it. We have to actually engage with ourselves first to really engage with, with um, that. And I'm minded of, um, I was in, Toronto, in Canada, in Toronto for the last couple of weeks uh, setting up 
a new project like this out there. And I was having this conversation with a nurse practitioner in a dementia unit um, in, in Hamilton. And, uh, and she's having a really challenging time at the moment because they have probably one of the most fantastic protocols I've seen uh, to do with sexuality and sexual health um, of people with dementia within this residential facility. And, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's very liberated, it's very morally grounded, very strong. And there is a, a lawyer in, uh, who's got an ethics background in Hamilton who's leading a one-woman campaign to have, in a sense, the home shut down unless it gets rid of this disgusting policy, you know, that, which essentially is older people with dementia having sex, and that she thinks that should not be allowed to happen, whatever. And it's, it's, the reason for race, it, it opens up, and it has opened up, this kind of incredibly interesting discussion, um, both locally, um, and the media have got hold of it, um, which hasn't helped particularly, but also among the care staff themselves about this notion of what's sacred or, and what is legitimate to allow to disappear from somebody's life at a particular point in, a point in time. And, and I, you know, of course there's no right or wrong answer to that. It is a case of care situation, really, within those things. But it, what's wrong for me is not having the discussion about it and not having the space within these practice settings where people can, can have those discussions. And that takes, takes me back to Janet's you know, question about we have to have those spaces in order for those things to happen. So the bit about language, I do agree with you as well, but it's about how we work with language. Um, and Habermas, the philosopher, talks about the importance of meaningful, critical social spaces. And for me, what makes a setting effective is where we have meaningful, critical social spaces. That is, people where spaces, no matter how complex the setting is, where people can sit and discuss these things in a meaningful way. Not, you know, you can't, you won't, you will, you know, but Okay, one last question. Oh, hi, Ellen. Didn't recognize you. <laughs> so many questions. <laughs> Yes. Except at the same time, we want to yeah. open doors and have a dialogue, don't we? I suppose my only comment on that, Helen, is that the HICWIS standards, and particularly the supplementary standards for dementia, have a huge focus on quality of care and quality of life. So hopefully through the standards, the bath will be as much a social experience as a kind of cleansing personal care experience. Yeah. But you can see the practitioners being in a terrible <laughs> They are, and I've, I've been having this conversation with some people from HICWA around it because I think um, like all these things they mature there's a it's not immature I don't mean that insulting way around you know the use of the standards and how the standards work that says you know you have to be ticking these boxes in this way but um, I do think there is an openness there for uh, for a, a dialogue to happen and, and that's everything I'm seeing is there's an openness for a dialogue to happen that says you know well these this is the picture frame how you populate it what you put inside is is going to change and is 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 open to negotiation really I'm not sure some of the inspectors have got to that point and that's about growing in, in a different way um, and about the whole culture because I, I think there is a tendency that the psychological safety is this contained controlled environment and we've seen some of that um, and it's not right, but it, you know, it's, it's a point in time. And I think what we need to do is to carry on uh, really pushing those boundaries, really having those conversations. Um, yeah, absolutely so. Absolutely so. But we, we, if we're doing that, we have to have systems in those settings to help people have those conversations. Because otherwise, we just compromise people. You know, or you end up with the ombudsman scenario that I described, where it just goes, there you go, that's, that's what you're going to get. One last question, Maria. Yeah. And it's also a big issue for older people, including those with dementia. And I was interested in your whole um, idea of care care triads and the complex relationships for care workers and the older people, their families, and the organisations providing care. And how would you actually put something like this in place for those professional care workers working with older people? Yeah. 
see, uh, and uh, you raise, you're dead right to challenge the notion that we do focus so heavily on residential care when it's actually a small proportion of the population of older people and older people with dementia um, living in society. For me, the same principles apply to community. So it's not about walls for me at all. It is about a whole values base upon which we build care systems. Um, so, for example, uh, some work I've been involved in around, you know, people at home who wander, um, for me, is, is just challenges this as much as anything else because, uh, you know, wandering is a positive thing, not a negative thing. Um, but yet we treat it as something that has to be managed, controlled, stopped, you know, all, all the rest of it. Um, but actually, if we apply the same principles of working with people, facilitating different engagements, looking at, you know, a community as a place where people live and receive care and live their lives, the same as they would in a care home setting, then we can apply those same kind of principles. It just requires us to look differently at it. But it doesn't work any differently, and that's what's critical to me. It's about the principles remain the same, where we operationalize them has to be thought about differently. Okay, on that note, I think we may finish up in the interest of time as well. I'd like you to join me and thank Brendan again for such an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. This podcast was brought to you by Trinity College Dublin. For further information, please visit our website, itunes.tcd.ie.